Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to This Week in Movies. This is, in fact, the second episode of This Week in Movies. And for those of you who don't know, this is a far more casual kind of podcast. After looking up the definition, this can officially be called a podcast, which is awesome. And it's great to be back. And in today's episode, of course, I will be recapping all of the movie news, along with, towards the end of it at least, a kind of spoiler-heavy review or at least a tidbit of an analysis into certain spoiler related things of X-Men Days of Future Past, a film that I have reviewed as well, but that was a spoiler free review. And before I continue, I just like to say that I intend on doing this a lot because I'm having a lot of fun with it and this is a far more casual thing as compared to my other reviews wherein I edit the audio and the video and there were a couple of things I wanted to talk about before I get into the news. Firstly, and if you want to skip ahead, By all means, look at the time codes up ahead to any particular story or thing you're interested in. Now, the first thing is, I got to 500 subscribers. I mean, that is a place I never thought I'd get to. It's, it makes me so grateful to each and every one of you that have stuck around for so long. And I mean, I cannot thank you. Uh, I cannot thank you enough. And the thing is, To really add to that, I got about 100 to 150 subscribers in just about the past month, month and a half. So it gives me a bit of an inkling in the sense that what I'm doing is sort of on a better or at least more enjoyable track. And lastly, I'm going to have a tough time putting up videos as often as possible. One, because of time constraints, but really I managed to get around that. The other thing is that... My computer's been giving a few issues, so, you know, it's hard to watch films on my computer, let alone, but frankly, it's way more difficult to edit them. My trackpad is stuck. It's all a mess. Now, without further ado, let's get right into the movie news. First up, Star Wars. Star Wars has had a couple of bits of news. One is, of course that Gareth Edwards will be directing the spin-off set for 2016. I made a separate video on this. You can check that out, and then I'll put the link in the description below. But um, to summarize most of my thoughts, while I think Gareth Edwards is an interesting choice because Godzilla, at least visually and everything, was great, and Gareth Edwards did a great job handling what I believe was an absolutely massive scope, I'm still a tidbit cautiously optimistic because... While I enjoyed Godzilla, there there were a few things in it that didn't entirely work for me. One was, of course, where they tease you a lot when it came to the monster Godzilla itself. But really, it was some of the issues that I had relating to a couple of characters here and there. And I think that while, yes, visuals and the spectacle of everything is a big part of direction, so is really delving into the characters on screen. And while I thought they did a great job and the world that was created was extremely realistic, it did fall short on a couple of character-based elements, though those were my more minor complaints of the film. Anyway, so Gareth Edwards is a pick for Star Wars. It's interesting. I don't know what, um, you know, character they're going to take on, whether it's new or old. Probably an old character. Again, the most rumored is Boba Fett, which I've probably been convinced at this point. You know, I've been hearing Boba Fett being thrown around for so long. Others say Han Solo's a possibility, Chewbacca's a possibility, even Yoda's a possibility. I'm honestly, more Star Wars to me is a good thing. But at the same time, there is a bit of an argument that I have against myself, which is that Star Wars is a franchise that's really different from other franchises. It doesn't necessarily warrant such, um, you know kind of branches into the spin-off world, wherein, if you take a look at the Star Wars lore, at least from the film perspective, from 1 through 6, it is one straight line, one gigantic linear storyline. And to kind of, you know, add branches to all that, while, I mean, it will appease a lot of fans, including myself, and, you know, if the film is great, I'll be happy with it, but... I'm not sure that this particular franchise necessarily warrants spin-off films, you know? It just doesn't feel like they would fit necessarily into the Star Wars universe. And dare I use the word sanctity, but it may even reduce the sanctity, if you will, of the, um, of, you know, the, the main 
a linear storyline that is episode one and now we're gonna have uh, seven of course so of course I'll take my words back if you know it fits in somehow but really at the current point in time I'm not a hundred percent sure or at least happy about the fact that spin-offs are happening but I can still certainly look forward to it and furthermore it's coming out in December 2016 and the trend I'm starting to observe is since Disney owns Marvel and Star Wars, usually Star Wars are May-based summer films, but I think they've understood that they, that they could execute a bit more of a family demographic when it comes to uh, the Star Wars franchise. So they're going to be pushing Star Wars more for December releases. Expect maybe another spin-off in 2017 and Episode 8 in 2018 for all we know. And I think that they're going to be pushing their Marvel-based franchises more for May. And now there was another bit of Star Wars news. It was a short clip which had J.J. Abrams basically talking about a bit of a charity uh, that was hosted by Omaze. Wherein if you donate, you have a chance of uh, getting a cameo appearance in Star Wars Episode 7. And I mean... One, that's incredibly intelligent because the number of people that are going to donate are certainly going to be in large numbers. But at the same time, there was something about this video that a lot of people have taken to, you know, in a positive way, I mean. When he's talking, of course he's on a set, and everyone started talking about the practicality of the film. Now, yes, he's on a set that to me looks a bit like Tatooine, and there's this alien-esque creature that walks by. So, you know, it's interesting. It looks cool. And everyone has suddenly been up and saying, Oh, the Star Wars Episode Seven is going back to the practical roots and everything. And is this enough to really go to that judgment all of a sudden? I don't think so. I think, I think it's... I think it's too soon to say that. While, of course, we know J.J. Abrams wants to, this real second or moment that occurs in this video has caused fans all around to think that oh it's so practical even if you think about it the prequels while they were mostly shot on a green screen or in a studio still lots of set pieces were shot on location that's something that a lot of people discount so i think that at the current point in time this whole jump about the practicality while it i think it's a good thing that they're going for a different style of filmmaking or something that J.J. Abrams is certainly more used to, I still think it's a bit too soon to really say, wow, look at the practical effects that they're using in the film. I think we're going to have to wait a little bit more before we can really jump to all of that. Now, the next story is about DC Cinematic Universe and the title of the upcoming DC film that is releasing on May 6, 2016 has been released and it is Batman v Superman. Dawn of Justice. Now, this title has created a bit of a split, of course, and to me, I'm relatively indifferent because while, yes, a title does give you an idea of what the focus of the film is, like if you take a look, The Hobbit there and back again versus The Hobbit, The Battle of Five Armies, another title that was recently changed, you get the idea of what the focus of the film really is on, but it's not incredibly different from the titles that were earlier rumored, in my personal opinion. And some things I've observed. One, I do not feel that the subtitle of Dawn of Justice is entirely necessary. I I would have been fine with the Batman v Superman and something about just V and not VS. It felt a bit off to me. Like, the title doesn't roll off the tongue as it should uh, for any title for that matter. But, um, you know, thinking about it, it's, it is significant news to, you know at least know, okay, this is happening, this is the title, whatever, whatever, but it's relatively insignificant if you think about it. Like, there's two sides to it. Even the earlier image of Ben Affleck that was released as Batman, one side is, is just an image, but the second side is if you read into it just enough, there are things that you understand, and with regards to this title, of course, um, a lot of people have taken akin to how Batman v Superman is like legal terminology, wherein Batman... Uh, that is the name preceding the V is supposedly the person who has an accusation and Superman or the person who is after the or the name that's placed after the V um, they are said to be the one that is accused so if you read into it that much the kind of thing we're going after is that 
Batman, or at least in this case Bruce Wayne, is going after Superman, perhaps because of the destruction of Metropolis, because really, if you think about how much the world is observed about Superman in Man of Steel, a film that I personally was not entirely satisfied by, frankly, I didn't like it at all, but that's another discussion for another time, I think it could be interesting if you have Batman slash Bruce Wayne going after Superman, thinking that Superman has done something wrong, and maybe, maybe through the events of the film, them coming together, and it culminating in the dawn of justice, and frankly, the dawn of the Justice League is what they might as well call it, and at the same time, come to think of it now, they have Lex Luthor, so if what I'm saying is right, that Batman is going to be going after Superman first, and really taking the first shot, if you will, he might do so with the help of Lex Luthor, that is going to be portrayed by Jesse Eisenberg, of course. Again, massive speculation for news that is relatively small because to me I did not like Man of Steel at all and this is the least of my worries about the film. The next story or the next bit of news that we have is about Marvel's Ant-Man and most of the news we've been having about Marvel has been positive news except for this bit. This is really unfortunate to be honest. This is the first time in a long time that we've seen this kind of an issue with regards to Marvel. Now let me give a bit of the backstory. Edgar Wright has been working on Ant-Man probably since 2006 or 2007, before the release of Iron Man itself, and Kevin Feige, the producer of all the Marvel films and the Avengers, of course, has been incredibly supportive, incredibly supportive of Edgar Wright. Recently, we find out that Edgar Wright, director of films like Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz and The World's End, they're all fantastic films, He's left the project because of creative differences. While now on the surface it doesn't seem entirely bitter in terms of him and of course Joe Cornish, the other writer of the script, leaving, still this is by no means good news. Edgar Wright is by far one of the most talented directors I've seen and the style and the imprint that he has on, fi on, on films, on his films at least, writing and directing perspectives, fantastic. And I think that the way Marvel is going, trying to be a little more lighthearted and add a lot of humor in their films and try and do something slick and new in the way that it seems to be, at least that they're trying to do with Guardians of the Galaxy, Ant-Man would have been perfectly in their wheelhouse and a perfect addition, if you will, to, you know, follow the Avengers Age of Ultron. So, from that perspective, losing Edgar Wright is a massive loss. But some of the information that's come across via Latino Review is that, you know... Edgar Wright and Joe Cornish, the writers, they took the studio notes. They made a few edits to their script here and there, but really didn't want to sacrifice on the original vision. And after a point, Marvel, they sent the script to one of their in-house writers who changed it up and, according to the reporter, of course, kind of removed the soul of the film and changed a lot of it. And I don't think Edgar Wright and Joe Cornish took to that nicely, so they decided to leave the project. And I mean, working on this for eight years almost, and with the fact that shooting has already begun and now there were shooting delays due to rewrites, it's not a good sign behind this project. Not at all. I mean, on, on the one hand, most of the production has been undertaken by Edgar Wright, a good thing. But then again, one, you know, if one director can execute with a particular set of resources in one way. So if Edgar Wright has set up these resources, we don't know what they are. Maybe they would work to Edgar Wright's strengths, but to the new director, they might not work particularly to his strengths. And it's this original vision that, you know, I was looking forward to, a lot of people were looking forward to. It doesn't seem like we're going to get it, unfortunately. Nonetheless, I mean, I will give it to Marvel because I've loved all of their films so far, but this is one bit of news that, after a very long time, has made me heavily, heavily disappointed. The next bit of news that we have is about Django Unchained. In fact, Quentin Tarantino for a bit. First, he spoke about The Hateful Eight, wherein he says that, you know, he after, what, after the whole script leak and everything, he might publish it as a novel, he's probably going to make the film, he might make it a stage play for all you know. He said he might even do all three, and to see him branch off into the other mediums is interesting, because I, I greatly appreciate Quentin Tarantino. I think he's a fantastic writer-director, 
But what he spoke about Django Unchained is something I found interesting because there were rumors earlier on, long, long ago, probably even a year ago, just after the uh, release of the DVD and Blu-ray of Django Unchained, wherein there were rumors that we could get to see an extended cut of Django Unchained, a around four-hour cut of the film. And the film's only about two and a half hours, two hours 40 at most. So to get an extra 80 to 90 minutes is, for someone who loves the film like me, considering it's one of my favorite films of all time, it is something magnificent, something I was looking forward to. And I mean, again, it was a rumor at the time, so it never really came to fruition, but now Quentin Tarantino has spoken about it, and he says he doesn't want to release it as one single four-hour cut. Rather, he would be much happier, much happier releasing it as a mini-series with four episodes, and I'm incredibly open to that, because if you take a look at the film and the structure of Django Unchained, it feels very episodic in and of itself, and they've released a lot of comic books as well that chronicle the journey of this, and... 80 to 90 minutes of extra footage, I think, personally, is something that the world, I mean, not the world, but you know what I mean, that people around the world are going to be looking forward to see, considering the brand name of Quentin Tarantino in general, and the success of that film, having a Django Unchained miniseries is not a bad idea, but, I mean, you know, it might not even be true, although he has said that he looks forward to having it as a miniseries, I think that there will be several different broadcasters that will be looking forward to, um, of course, you know, promoting it and, in fact, showing it on their channel. And I think that there is a good enough market for a Django Unchained miniseries, so let's hope for the best as a Django Unchained fan. The next bit of news we have is, well, I can't call it news because we know very little about this, but... To me, this is genuinely some of the most significant news in filmmaking. There is a project about the Cold War coming up, directed by Steven Spielberg, starring Tom Hanks, and penned by the Coen brothers, three people who, in their respective fields, are not just, you know, of the master class, but perhaps even at the top of their respective lists, arguably, of course, but the talent they've displayed in their lives throughout is unimaginable. And to have these three teams come together, and I call them teams even if they're individuals because they are that powerful, it's interesting. The, the scope of what they could achieve is endless. And, I mean, I'm looking forward to it. I don't know what it's about, but I can tell you today, without a title, a synopsis, a release date, or anything, this set of names itself, for anyone who appreciates films, I think should be enough to want you to watch that film. It, it could be something special, and frankly, if you take a look, Steven Spielberg, his last film, Lincoln, Widely well-received, fantastically directed Tom Hanks, his last performance, Captain Phillips. Widely well-received, oh, so well-appreciated, missed out on the Oscar nomination, unfortunately. Even the Coen brothers, while they did miss out on the Oscar nominations, of course, Inside Lewin Davis was a film that was almost universally loved by the relatively smaller crowd that saw it. So if you look at the past projects, they, they really haven't messed up all that much, and the history of the films that they've made, it is something that would take hours to praise, to, to really praise enough to tell you and convey to you just how good their respective filmographies are. This could be, I'm, I'm looking at this way in advance, ma massive speculation, but this could potentially be, you know, a film to remember to say the least. The next bit of news that we have is, well, it's sort of a couple of different news articles that I've put together to kind of put under one headline, that is the X-Men who have been, well, talking about the Avengers. First off, Hugh Jackman, he says he's open to the idea of, Hugh, uh, of the Wolverine and um, that is Iron Man, of course, working together, teaming up together. It would be great to see for us film fans, although we know that Simon Kinberg himself said that the prospect of X-Men and the Fantastic Four crossing over is not 
exactly a possibility yet. So this is this is far, far away. Believe me, this is not going to happen. But it's just the idea of it that they've spoken about. So Hugh Jackman, very good with his PR. He's open to it. He's positive about it. James McAvoy, while he said it would be cool, he went on to say this is now closer to the release date of Days of Future Past. He says that the X-Men would probably kick the Avengers' ass. And okay, that kind of confidence is good. You know, and it really wasn't a bad statement in my personal opinion. He's promoting the film, and all in all, it might even be possible, you know, uh, considering the number of X-Men and all the various powers they have. But really, the statement that stood out to me was Brian Singer's. Because, I mean, it it felt like, you know, he tipped the line. Like, there was a line where it was fun and sarcastic, but I think he took one step over that line. And... Brian Singer, while he might be proud of the film and while he, it might be getting great reviews, X-Men Days of Future Past, that is, I think to say some of the stuff he said, at least the way it came across to me, might be jumping the gun. Because Marvel Studios and the Avengers franchise, undoubtedly, monetarily, at least if that's one of the many means in which we can compare, but from a monetary perspective, the Avengers is far ahead of X-Men. Far ahead. Now, you could be an Avengers fan, you could be an X-Men fan, you could be a fan of both as I am, but really, it's not a brand you really want to mess around with. And what Brian Singer, he basically made a very sarcastic statement wherein he says it would be great to see this hero, that hero, Iron Man, and Iron Man. Oh, and did I mention Iron Man? And he basically alludes to the fact that Iron Man is the face of the franchise, and that Iron Man is the only real hero and all sorts of things like that, and that it's less so about the Avengers, but more so about Iron Man. Now, I have two responses to that. One, not entirely. I mean, yes, I can definitely listen to the argument that Iron Man is your quote-unquote main hero, considering that in the Avengers... While some people do say he had the, he didn't even have the most amount of screen time in that film amongst the heroes, he did have the biggest role. So I understand that. He is the most money-making of the heroes. I understand that. But at the same time, look at your own franchise, Brian Singer. I mean, X-Men. <laughs> is it really, has it ever, apart from First Class, has it ever been about the X-Men? Not so much. You still have the Wolverine pl playing the role of what Iron Man is to the Avengers. In fact, to a far greater degree, in my personal opinion. So, making this statement in and of itself is a bit radical. You know, not acknowledge he's, he's going on and on about how Iron Man is the face of the Avengers. Isn't Wolverine the face of the X-Men, literally, in the same manner? It's just a bit of a thought I had. And at the same time, I thought the statements were a bit unnecessary on his part. Anyway, it's, it's a minor thing, but something that did certainly stick out to me. The next bit of news that we have is about the Cannes Film Festival of 2014. Now, for those of you who don't know the Cannes Film Festival, it really awards films that, while I certainly cannot say that they are for everyone and they're definitely not your blockbusters, these films, even though the Cannes Film Festival is now, these films release later on in the year, they gain a lot of buzz, and some of them end up picking up Oscar nominations. Now, while the Palme d'Or winner is a Turkish film called The Winter's Sleep and has the potential to be nominated for Best Foreign Language Film, even though last year's winner, if I'm not mistaken, was Blue is the Warmest Color, which didn't even get nominated for Best Foreign Language Film, the one film that I think that is going to stand out on top from all the films at Cannes is Foxcatcher. Foxcatcher, by, directed by Bennett Miller, he won Best Director which is not an easy thing. Th films like Inglorious Bastards premiere at Cannes. You know, so you can definitely understand the quality of films, but at the same time, you know, Foxcatcher is a film I'm looking forward to from a performance perspective alone. I The positive word of mouth of Steve Carell's performance is unimaginable, even if Channing Tatum's performance, something I'm really looking forward to see. So... All in all, from Cannes, I mean, I can't comment on a lot of the international-based films. Films like uh, The Homesman by Tom Lee Jones, if I'm not mistaken, have been well-received, but it is Foxcatcher that is really catching on, and something that I think you should stick around for, 
sitcom award season because winning Best Director, Bennett Miller's made films like Capote and Moneyball. So you know the kind of films he's making and you know he appeals to the Oscars. So if you're into the Oscars and the whole award season, I'm just giving you a heads up right now. Look around, stick around for Foxcatcher because that's definitely going to get some nominations. The next bit of news, again, a, a relatively smaller piece of news, if you will, is about Lego Ninjago being announced for 2016. Now, again, there are two sides to a lot of the news stories. There's a positive and a negative side. I'm going to address both because, again, I'm sort of in the middle. The positive side is Lego Ninjago. The Lego movie was, you know, fantastic. And if Lego Ninja Go, while it's a different brand, while it's certainly a relatively more popular brand amongst Lego sub-brands, of course, it, it has the potential to be great. It has enough appeal. So from a marketing perspective, it'll make the job a little bit easier. And the Lego movie success and the quality of that film, making it one of what is still to this date one of my favorite films of the year, if Lego Ninja Go is handled even by the same producers, by a director who has the potential to do great stuff, well, I don't think Phil, Philip Lord and Chris Miller would be returning for Lego Ninja Go. Technically not returning, but I don't think they'll be undertaking Lego Ninja Go. And they're not undertaking the Lego Movie 2, which is scheduled for 2017. I think that the potential of Lego Ninja Go is, is very high at this point. It would delve into a different era of time and seeing that in the lego world something that has appealed to the masses in fact would be great to see but at the same time the negative side to it is is this too soon i mean lego ninja go it, it just reading about it to me was a little bit strange to be honest that's how it hit me that was the lego movie so impactful while yes one of the best received films of the year still. One of my favorite films of the year still. Did it make enough money? Did it hit enough audiences for the studio to say that we need to go to any Lego brand from now on? Even if it's Ninja Go, a far less known brand and perhaps delivering a far less universal story. Do we need to go to that? I don't think so. I think... Having the Lego Movie 2 before Lego Ninja Go might have been a better idea. You know, letting that, you know, the success just add to it. And then moving on with these sub-brands. Again, just my thought on it. I think it's a little bit soon to delve into brands like this. But, you know, in the right hands, this film has the potential to be fantastic. Now let's take a quick look and recap the box office for the past weekend, pretty much the weekend. So, one quick news story that came from the box office is that Frozen defeated Iron Man 3 at the worldwide box office. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. It just outgrossed it by a few million dollars. It's now got more than 1.2 billion. It's the highest grossing film worldwide of 2013. That is Frozen I'm talking about. And frankly speaking... This is huge news. Fifth highest grossing film of all time. When I saw Frozen, I saw it like on opening day or opening weekend, and I thought to myself, that was a great movie. I never saw this coming. I didn't even think it would hit a billion dollars. But, you know, again, while I enjoyed the film, it probably wasn't even my favorite animated film last year. I'd probably give that to Monsters University, another discussion for another time, but still, it was a really good film. And a film that I could tell, you know, judging by the genuine response, had this massive appeal to adults and children alike. And that's one reason, one, universal appeal, of course. But the main reason that I think it's done well is because of repeated viewings. Because it's a film with massive quality that, ha frankly, you know, it went up against a film like The Hobbit you know, that should be doing better than an unknown franchise film, and it ended up doing well, which makes me happy. It really makes me happy that, film li that a film like Frozen is doing well. And to add to all that, it's a film that, one, will teach the studios a couple of things. 
First off, you know, the, you always have this argument about female leads and whatnot. Female animated leads l taking this film to the highest of heights. Great. Great for the film industry, you know. Honestly, this will make studios realize that the gender bias isn't as strong as some people see it. Furthermore, they will realize that the quality of the film at the end of the day is what is most important. It is what is paramount to a film. Yes, I can, I'm going to give you the example of The Amazing Spider-Man 2. It's an overused example already. It's been up for just a few weeks, but take a look at that film. That film had the potential, the potential to reach a billion dollars. It currently has about 670 million worldwide. It's getting nowhere near a billion. But had that film been better in quality, you would have had repeat viewings. You would have had people. I, when people have asked me, should I go see the film? I said, you're not going to miss out a lot if you don't watch it. I was planning on watching it a second time before actually going in, into the film for the first time. After the first viewing, I said, I don't need to watch it again. And that's, that's the response of a lot of people. So in that sense, I, I hope that the studios understand, considering this outgrossed Iron Man 3 what was at its time one of the biggest films of all time and for good reason but really this is huge news this is this is a cinematic event this is a new story to be remembered because it will teach the studio something and i hope it does and i hope they take note that quality and actually connecting to people on the most basic human level as frozen did is something essential for your film to succeed commercially and critically. Now, some of the other films that came out this weekend, of course, X-Men Days of Future Past, which I will get into a bit of a spoilers review very soon, it made $111 million on its opening four-day weekend, about $91 million on the three-day weekend, which is just short of Godzilla, just short of The Amazing Spider-Man 2, and just short of Captain America the Winter Soldier by about three to four million dollars. And at the same time, worldwide, it's already outgrossed 300 million. And like four days, and take note studios, the critical success that X-Men Days of Future Past is, it's, it's fantastic. I managed to watch the film a day before its release, and I said, I'm gonna watch it again on opening day. And I'm not the only one. Just like me, there are many people out there who said, I'm going to rewatch this film. And that's the effect that Frozen had, and that's the effect that I think X-Men Days of Future Past is going to have. Opening to 300 million worldwide, it will undoubtedly be the highest grossing of the franchise, which is, in fact, a shockingly low 459 million on the part of X-Men The Last Stand. With the addition of 3D, of course, it'll do well. I think something like 600 to 650 million looks very possible, maybe even more than that. Maybe even more than that. And that just shows the quality. Quality is unbeatable when it comes to films. Quality will ultimately take, you know, the upper hand. Maybe not in the short run, but in the long run. I think X-Men Days of Future Past has the potential to now go, maybe go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Captain America the Winter Soldier, just maybe from a worldwide perspective. Furthermore, we had Godzilla, which released last week to a whopping $93 million, and... It grossed about 31 to 33 on this weekend, a massive drop-off of about 66%, but worldwide it's already made $315 million. I think it's going to go to about half a billion dollars, which is good news for the film, of course. And, I mean, the sequel's been announced. Again, the money that's coming is fantastic for the studio. I'm not surprised, and I think that Godzilla had enough. Again, the quality of the film will reduce those drop-offs. Granted, the release of X-Men Days of Future Past won't help Godzilla's box office, but at the same time, in the long run, in the death weeks, as I like to call them, that is your, maybe your third or fourth week onwards, if you're, those are the weeks that really add those extra chunks of 50 to 60 million dollars. It can go that high. It could be as low as 10 million dollars for films as big as this. I still think that Godzilla has a long way to go, $500 million seems on the cards. X-Men Days of Future Past, 600, 650 seems easily on the cards at this point. And a film that just came out this weekend, Blended, 
made about $18 million on opening weekend. Shockingly low for an Adam Sandler and, in fact, Drew Barrymore film. Considering Grown Ups 2 outgross Pacific Rim to gross $40 million on opening weekend. $40 million. This has made $18 million. This, it, it's just adding to my, my argument. And while, of course, my argument might not be 100% correct, I think, while yes, some people could say, you know, oh, you can join two random points anywhere through one particular argument. But if you have three points in a straight line, then there's a difference. Then you see a trend. And the trend that I've been observing in the box office over the past couple of months is that quality is being the ultimate influence. Yes, most people will go for X-Men Days of Future Past. Even if a film like Grown Ups 2, marketed solely as an Adam Sandler comedy, while you do have a lot of heroes in, I mean, not heroes, you have a lot of other, you know, comedic actors in there, and it was technically a brand, Adam Sandler in and of himself has become kind of a brand, and films like That's My Boy, films like Jack and Jill performed better, and Blended might not even make a hundred million at the box office worldwide. It may, it'll probably cross it, but just barely. And, I mean, it's unfortunate that this film, it was expected to do better, but, you know, at the end of the day, I think with the large summer releases we have now and even up in the upcoming weeks, it's really just not going to go well for Blended. Speaking of the upcoming weeks, I'm going to give you a quick preview into what we have coming up in the next few, well, the next few days, or at least this week, in terms of the films that are releasing in theaters. The first is Maleficent. Maleficent, when the trailers, looks interesting. It looks like an interesting take on the particular story it's undertaking, and Angelina Jolie, I haven't seen her in much lately. After The Tourist, I really haven't seen her do any film, to be honest, so... Maleficent, though, as a Disney film, has been marketed well. It's about a it's about a witch. I'm trying to connect the dots as to which Disney story it's undertaking. But again, as a Disney film, it's going to do a great job at the box office. Although it might not be entirely what they're expecting North American, at least from the North American box office. But the worldwide box office, it'll ultimately it'll have legs. It'll it'll do well. The reviews so far are all right. They're good. So I think Maleficent has the potential to be great. But the film I'm more looking forward to this weekend is A Million Days to Die in the West. Now, Ted, which was also made by Seth MacFarlane, the maker of A Million Days to Die in the West, I, I've i seen that film twice now. And the first time I enjoyed parts of it, the second time I realized, yes, it does have a lot of imperfections. A lot of imperfections. And... Seth MacFarlane's comedy, you know, he does Family Guy and everything. It's different. It doesn't appeal to everyone. And I'm kind of in the middle ground. Because to me, when it's good, it's really good. But when it's not good, I'm out of it. You know, I, I rarely find that mo Like, I can both love it and hate it. But I don't have that moment in particular where I'm like, oh, okay, you know, I'm just going with it. Like... In Ted especially, there were scenes where I was completely put off and there were scenes where I was completely energized and ready and enjoying the film. And I get the feeling that A Million Days to Die in the West could be similar to that. It's a live-action film wherein Seth MacFarlane is the main character. It's based in the wild, wild west, you know, the old days. And it's got a great cast with Liam Neeson and Charlize Theron. It's a film that could be fantastic. And it's a film I would recommend staying away from the trailers from considering the fact that it's comedy. I... Comedies nowadays, I stray away from the trailers because they usually, well, at least time from experience, they they show you some of the best stuff in those in, in the trailers. And I, especially in comedies, it's so easy to ruin the film through the trailers. So one thing, stay away from the trailers. My personal pick between Maleficent and A Million Days to Die in the West, it really depends. A Million Days to Die in the West is an R-rated comedy. Maleficent is more a family film. I think while Maleficent could out... I, you know, the box office, it's still hard to say, but if, you know, you're above the age of 18, you, you're you not sure which film to watch, A Million Days to Die in the West could be, I haven't seen either film, 
could be a make or break. I, you, me recommending it to you is pointless because you should go in and watch it and determine whether you're going to love it or whether you're going to hate it. That's the kind of film like it seems. Maleficent, on the other hand, seems like a little more of a safe bet in terms of quality that more people would enjoy it. But the degree to which they enjoy it might not be extreme. It might be, you know, a middle ground. It might be an okay film. But at the end of the day, if I had to pick one film that I'd watch first, I'm going to go for A Million Days to Die in the West. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let us delve into X-Men Days of Future Past. Now, if you've been listening this far, congrats. You, you deserve a medal. You deserve a prize. I will send it to you. And let's get into X-Men Days of Future Past. Now, if you've seen my spoiler-free review, I'll leave a link to that in the description below. I loved X-Men Days of Future Past. One of my favorites this year. Top four, top five. And I mean, of course, by the end of the year, let's see where it ends up. But the film to me, now I've seen it twice. And I'm going to break it down scene for scene and give you some of my general thoughts of first. Now, I was so worried about the film. I was so worried because of Brian Singer. Because Jack the Giant Slayer was a film directed by him I did not like. Superman Returns was okay. Valkyrie I didn't particularly like. I wasn't even a fan of the, the first two X-Men films, to be honest. X2 was better than X1, but I wasn't a, a huge fan of either of them. So I was pretty cautious about Days of Future Past. And I loved, loved, loved X-Men First Class, the film that in some form precedes this. So I was excited and I was so satisfied. Yes, the film does have issues, and more that I actually saw upon the second viewing, but my overall opinion on the film has almost negligibly changed, to be honest. Let's get into it. Let's break it down from the first scene alone. The first scene is, in fact, a prologue, and for someone who doesn't know what the film is about, the prologue is good, and for someone who knows what the film is about, it's an easy way to get you into the universe of the film, because that opening shot in and of itself where they show, where they go through perhaps, could be the Empire State Building. And they're in New York, New York City, and it's almost post-apocalyptic, and it is ruined, and I repeat, ruined. It was, it, that shot alone set the stage for the film, and I thought that that prologue was really well done. And you do get glimpses of, you know, a person with M above their eye and whatnot in order to, you know give you hints if you're into the comic books, but even if you're not, it gives you a good sense of the world you're in, and the way the prologue ends is with a question saying, is the future really set? And you're into it, and then you have the opening titles, and then the film kind of gets in to the meat of it from the get-go, and I thought, what I loved about the film was it relentlessly almost reels you in. Even though I had my issues with it here and there, I was stuck and glued to that screen for the whole two hours, two hours, ten minutes. So now the first fight scene, again, something I really liked in this particular case, something that I was actually pleased that Brian Singer managed to pull off, was where rather than having unnecessary expository dialogue, a simple visual can do the trick. A very simple visual of a sentinel who's, you know, who's fighting with Colossus and suddenly turns into metal. You figure out there and then, you know, okay, they can absorb powers. It was that easy. It was so simply done. And, you know, various things like that throughout the film that, you know, they don't feel the need to force the exposition down your throat. Rather, it's there and you can easily absorb it because you're really into the film it was something I liked. And, of course, that opening fight scene was great, especially to see Blink, someone who I don't think we've seen before in the, in the X-Men franchise, her powers in particular were fantastic. While I don't think that she had much of a role at all in this film, it was good to see her. And when you see towards the end of this initial fight scene that, you know, I loved, of course, how the superheroes were, you know, together using their powers, you know, together and making them, you know, working together. There's a lot of togetherness. And I know I just used that word too much. And unfortunately, I don't edit the podcast, so that sucks. But I'm saying that when you see them use these vastly different powers in, you know, together, you got the point, right? It was interestingly done in how they 
uh, work they work with one another. It was something really interesting to see in that particular fight scene. And then you have Kitty Pride and Bishop who run towards a who run into a safe, and she's doing something to him. Kitty Pride is doing something to Bishop. She has his hands around his head, and at that point in time, I'm like, okay, something's going on. I will be patient. And in this film, by the way, you do have to be patient because things aren't given to you on the you know on the face. You have to wait for things to be explained to you, and it works for it works to the film as a strength rather than it being you confused. It's just another way of ma- reeling you in and making you more interested, and in fact, adding to the bit of mystery that the film possesses here and there, which I get into later, of course. But Kitty Pride, she's doing something to him, and then a sentinel is about to attack, and then they disappear. And when they disappear, and before I continue, I just want to say one thing: spoilers. <laughs> Mega spoilers for X-Men Days of Future Past, so you've been warned. Anyway, so they disappear, and I was like, okay, that's interesting. And then you see them in the very next scene, and when we saw them there, I thought to myself, if that was a training exercise, this is the exact thought I had, I thought to myself, if that was a training exercise, that would be the worst possible thing they could do. But no, even that action scene conceptually well visualized but a solid part of the story in explaining to you that you know they have to keep going into the past and I like that I I, I liked it it was simple it was interesting and it was a good way to present the fact that they have to go through this as a rinse and repeat and that in tandem with the prologue gives you the sense of despair that the heroes are a part of and then, of course, you're introduced to Wolverine and Storm and uh, Professor X and Magneto. Good to see a lot of the heroes back. And their explanation of sending back the Wolverine was good in the sense that he has to regenerate and stuff. Initially, I was thinking, why the Wolverine? I mean, I love him. I love you, Jackman and the Wolverine to death. But is it because he's the face of the franchise? Not necessarily. The explanation satisfied me just enough. But at the same time, one thing I found a little odd, and the film, (laughs) there's so many things. Some people bring up about the fact that the Wolverine has adamantium claws. In this particular case, there are a lot of continuity errors, a lot of continuity errors that the film doesn't feel like acknowledging and you kind of roll with, but they didn't really bother me, at least during the film. And one in particular is Kitty Pride of the fact that she can send people's consciousness back in time. Didn't I mean okay? She never had that power, and while certain people's powers generate over time, as we know with Xavier, I'm just saying, logically, <clears throat> excuse me, logically, having Xavier send someone back in time would have made a lot more sense, would have been a lot easier, considering they in fact mentioned he has the most powerful mind on the planet. So, you know, that was a minor little gripe, but I managed to live with it, considering Xavier's powers of reading into people's minds and sending people's consciousness back in time makes a lot more sense than Kitty Pride running through walls and sending people's consciousness back through time. I might have preferred Xavier, but really, it's a minor thing. I understand why they couldn't do Xavier later on because of certain scenes. Now, we understand, and I liked when they showed the past bit of it. It was, you know, what the problem is, and it really, again, simply presents to you what needs to be done. They have to stop Mystique from killing Bolivar Trask. Great, and then he goes back, and when the Wolverine is back, it's, he immediately, from a character perspective, it seemed fitting that the Wolverine jumps immediately to, would you believe me if I were sent here from the future, they say no, they take out their guns, and the Wolverine is in it, and he, he realizes he has no time to waste, and that's what I loved about the film, that there is not much time being wasted at all. And the plot flows naturally, it, and frankly, they everything, there was not a single moment of downtime in this film. That's something I really liked. No bit of downtime at all, and every single bit of it was relevant to the story and to the larger bit of, you know, hope that they were trying to deliver. Something that I really enjoyed, a little bit of a happy film, if you will, But anyway, now, they move on, and the Wolverine goes to meet 
James McAvoy's uh, Professor X. And when he meets Beast, and first off, I loved that Beast was a massive part of this film. Beast and Nicholas Hoult, frankly, as a character, he didn't have an awful lot of screen time in X-Men First Class, but to see him here get more of that, he deserved it because his character, his portrayal of the character won, but his character in general was really well fleshed out in the little bit of time that Matthew Vaughn had in X-Men First Class, so I was happy to see more of Beast. And when they show you Charles Xavier in this film, he's walking one, the explanation was again well done that he needs to take some medicine because frankly the voices in his head were too much because of his power, but you get to see an absolutely broken man. A, a, a direction I did not see coming to be honest, that they would they would go that deep into this character that the suffering that he has undergone because of all the events because of the fact that he's lost everything not just his childhood friend not just Eric that he became friends with not just the fact that there are a lot of things uh, including you know the assassination of JFK that uh, Eric has been accused of but the fact that his powers are getting out of control the school didn't exactly work out it's it all has culminated to this extremely broken man so well portrayed by James McAvoy so well portrayed and I love that at the end of the day while yes I believe in X-Men first class because you're introducing characters and frankly they do give you a bit more backstory on each character and they do delve in more into especially Charles and Eric something while I believe they delved into a lot in Days of Future Past they didn't delve into enough in my personal opinion I still think that Days of Future Past managed to give you enough from a character perspective. Moving on though, we have one scene in Vietnam wherein there's the war and Mystique goes and infiltrates and you get to meet William Stryker Jr. who's going to cause the Wolverine a lot of pain later on in the future and that fight scene to me again, it, it looked awful in The Amazing Spider-Man 2 credits. It looked awful. But they did it. It was well edited. And, and I, well, something I found interesting about the film also is that the music and the editor, I mean, sorry, the composer and the editor were done by the same person, John Ottman. A very unlikely combo. You have writer-directors. You have director-producers. A composer-editor, something almost unheard of, but something that I believe worked to the film's strength because there are two things, there are two components that add to a film's pace. And pace in this film, by the way, one of the best paced. It's weird, it's hard to classify it as one of the best paced, but it was fantastically paced. The two things that classify pace, one, the prime thing is editing. But to play around with the tone, the tension, and the pace of the film, that's the music. So to have the editor and the composer be the same person, it works as it works as a strength, in my personal opinion, for X-Men Days of Future Past. Now to move on we get what is arguably, well, probably actually not even arguably one of the best scenes of the film, if not the best scene. My personal opinion, the most enjoyable scene, wherein we have Peter Maximoff. That is Quicksilver. For those of you who do not know, Quicksilver in the comics is, of course, someone with massive powers, and it's going to be interesting to see and how people are going to compare the Quicksilver iteration that we'll get to see in the, in the Avengers Age of Ultron. One thing I loved... There was a hint of an Easter egg that I managed to pick up on where Quicksilver, when he's talking to Magneto, when he's breaking him out of prison, he says that, oh, what's your power? And Magneto sort of says that he can control metal or something. And Quicksilver says, huh, my mother knew someone who could do that. Small little nod to the fact that in the comic books, Magneto is in fact Quicksilver's father. So... It, it, it added to the tidbit of excitement, of course, but that scene, the envisioning of the scene wherein he has to stop the bullets that the guards have shot towards our heroes, undoubtedly one of the best, the best film scene all year, hands down, but still, I mean, I'm not going to credit the whole film, and I'm not going to say that the whole film relies on that scene. Actually, from a story perspective, now come to think of it, the, st the scene doesn't have too much to, to show, but in terms of giving you an idea of what a character is like, in terms of exciting you, 
In terms of doing what, you know, I hate to say this, but what a summer blockbuster, I hate using that term, but as a summer blockbuster, Days of Future Past delivered on all fronts. And that scene is the perfect combination of the kind of tone that they had. Something with, you know, this extreme lightheartedness, as well as this bit of sophistication in terms of how the scene was just envisioned and done. Really blending in this strange tone, <clears throat> excuse me, this strangely perfect tone that Days of Future Past had. Because the tone of the film, it's never dark and, you know, they, they don't have to be, oh, look, we're dark and gritty, dark and gritty. No, they don't do that. They don't make it extremely lighthearted either. They find, I'm not even going to call it a middle ground, but they've sort of created their own tone at this point that existed well in, in first class and that carried on in Days of Future Past. Now, moving on, we get to see um, a couple of scenes with Trask here and there, Bolivar Trask. Uh, of course, to see, you know, that one very interesting scene where we have Mystique as Bolivar Trask to go into the office to see op to autopsy files. One moment that I thought to myself that I did not like in that scene is where Mystique is walking up the stairs as Trask, and then when she's reached the top, she's Mystique. She had no reason to change her body type. No reason. Only from the, you know, I mean, no logical reason. She should have stayed as Trask. It was the smarter thing to do. But because they wanted to add tension to the scene and because they wanted to tell the audience that, oh, look, it's Mystique as Trask. It's not actually Trask, which they could have easily done through the yellow eyes, considering they rely on that at the end of the film. A minor complaint, really, but something that I felt was, oh, hey, we're not 100% sure that you'll get it. So here you go. One of the things wherein it felt like a bit of a contrast because they used minor visuals at earlier times to convey massive things with regards to Sentinels, as, as I mentioned earlier, and even at the end of this film. But this is an instance where they used massive visuals to, con to convey something absolutely minor, something that could have been done in a much easier way, something that didn't really need to be portrayed in that particular manner, Nonetheless, I, 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 was, I went on with it. I understood it, and I was completely fine with it. And you know, to move on, then what happens in one of what I believe, once again, after they've broken Magneto out, they're on the plane. And when they are in flight, the argument that Magneto has with Xavier, when he says, we were supposed to protect them, and everything, and the plane's almost going down because of his magnetic powers, and it was this entire plane segment of the film that for the first time in 14 years of watching these X-Men films, did I ever understand that, you know, because I mean, while it, first class, they couldn't have done this bit that I'm talking about, wherein Magneto has done so many bad things. Xavier is a man who doesn't want those things to happen pretty much. He hates Magneto. He hates Eric. But at the same time, he loves him. And there's this strange friendship that they have because there are moments where they're trying to defeat each other and there are moments where they're trying to, you know, play chess and have camaraderie. This was the first time on the plane where that actually felt natural to me. In the X-Men trilogy, it was so off in the way it was portrayed. But this was the first time in a long time, in fact, that it felt very natural to me, and that was a huge positive, because the, the dynamic between these two characters, as portrayed throughout the film, to see them friends fighting for the same thing against the greater evil in the future, as compared to Xavier punching Eric the first time he sees him in the past. Perfect contrast, in my personal opinion, something that definitely progresses the film. It gives you a great insight, and while I did say that there are certain things that you might not be able to enjoy having not seen the early X-Men films, at the same time, the character bits of it are not necessarily those moments. While yes, in certain things it takes you a bit, it might take you a bit longer to delve into a certain character having not visited the earlier X-Men films, I certainly think that there was just enough delivered for you to be on board, whether you've seen them or not. Moving on, though, one of another great scene 
Another great scene that comes up next is where they have to kind of basically, you know, stop Mystique from killing Trask. And when this scene was happening, I thought to myself, wow, we're getting to the end of the film. And this is just about the midway. That was the midway. And I was so satisfied by then, but it was just the mid mark. Mystique is about to kill Trask and then Magneto and Xavier and Wolverine show up and they prevent that from happening. It does have a bit of a negative effect, but one particular thing I liked about the scene is in terms of how it was shot. It was shot beautifully using, you know, partly the normal cameras and the normal aspect ratio that we have. And at the same time, the more, you know, underdeveloped cameras that they had back in the 70s and the news cameras that they had and changing the aspect ratio. Something that was not overused, but used perfectly, not just to be like, hey, look, we have different cameras, but at the same time, used intelligently. It gave you the eyes and the perspective of the fear that was at that point being struck in the human beings of the 70s. That was the purpose of it. Not that, oh, look, cool visual. No, that, in my personal opinion, that's how it came across to me, that the purpose was to show us, the, to give us an insight of the citizens and how they were seeing the event and the fear bet- that they were experiencing. That was a very well-executed visual, in my personal opinion. And the fight goes on and it continues. And, you know, it was interesting that how they managed to get Mystique's DNA. It was, again, it, and the theory, the absolute theory that Beast's character brings up was very, you know, haunting in a way. That the heroes might not achieve what they want to. Wherein... The space-time continuum, pretty much, is almost self-correcting. It's a theory. And, I mean, this is a later scene, but wherein it is self-correcting and stuff like that. And I thought that that was a pretty horrific moment. And how, in this case, it did kind of correct itself, wherein they still managed to get a hand of Mystique's DNA. But in this case, Trask wasn't dead, making it all the more difficult for um, the X-Men, of course. So now... Moving on, you get to see that the world is horrified by mutants and Nixon approves the Sentinel program and Trask, well, Peter Dinklage's performance in the film, uh, granted, the one issue I have with the film is that no particular character has enough screen time for me to say that was one of the best performances of the year. Maybe the Wolverine, but apart from that, no one. No one had that much screen time. Take a look at X-Men, X-Men First Class. It's Magneto and Xavier that stand out from beginning to end. This film, they, they were handled well. They were used beautifully, never overused, used in the right amount. Each and every character, there were more characters. They were handled well. The scope was handled well. But I can't say that any particular performance stood out to me. Anyway, so Trask goes to the president, and he has this massive amount of confidence, this huge amount of confidence saying, oh, I was waiting for you to ask that question, Mr. President, and he hands in the Sentinel program, it gets approved, and now we are moving on with the film, and the Sentinel thing is still continuing. And that is where the despair of the film continues, that despite tr- the fact that Trask is not dead, it's not the the war, and, in, and not the war, well, the, the task is not over. They're still, in fact, in fact, they've almost made it worse because they have Mystique's DNA and the mind and body and soul of Trask. It's going to get more difficult for the mutants to really figure this one out, thereby even raising the stakes that were already pretty high in the film. And now the next bit, the next small portion of this film adds to some of the best and yet some of the not so satisfying scenes of the film. Wherein we have Cerebro. The use of Cerebro throughout uh, the X-Men franchise has been fantastic. And to see James McAvoy try to tap into his powers once again, fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. And, you know, he, he's unable to do it. And there is one moment where... There's one moment where the film lost me, but there was a moment after that where the film got me. The moment where the film lost me is where... Xavier puts his hands on the Wolverine's hand and somehow manages to talk to the future Charles Xavier. Somehow breaks through time 
and do that. And that, within the film's logic of time travel, thinking about it, it didn't work. It Within the already, you know, I, I, can, I can go along with the logic that the film has that one can send someone back in time in their consciousness, but it, I never bought the fact that young Xavier and old Xavier could have ever communicated in that manner. Conceptually, the scene was powerful. It was useful. It added to the motivations of the characters and to, of course, help Xavier get his powers back. But I never bought the scene even for a moment. It, it was the one scene that kind of lost me. Unfortunately, in the trailers, it seemed like one of the best. Anyway, what I liked was the payoff of the scene because at this point in time, the Cerebro machine, you know, there were sparks flying out of it and then uh, the electricity goes, Beast goes to fix the power and then Beast comes in and says, the power's back on. And this has a bit of a double meaning, which is something I really enjoyed because then Xavier says, I know. And this is good. Th th that moment to me was extremely satisfying because not only is, of course, the electricity back on, but frankly, the prime power required was in Xavier's mind. And he received the hope that he needed to by meeting Xavier in the future. And that was the real power that was ultimately required for him to undertake Cerebro, which was something very essential for the film to, of course, continue, and something that I really liked. Anyway, then he manages to, uh, to meet Mystique at the airport. I mean, communicate with her, basically. In a scene that I thought was, again, really well done, wherein you have all these different people talking to her. And it was a simply and nicely envisioned scene and something that I really enjoyed. And we get another scene where Magneto's on top of a train. And this is one other thing I didn't buy. When I said the film had conveniences, this is the one apart from where the two Xaviers meet, that I just could not buy. Magneto inserts the metal rails into the Sentinels, but I never... I mean, yes, from the bullet perspective, sure, but I couldn't buy the fact that he managed to activate the Sentinels that way. Even if the Sentinels were without power, they could still shoot the bullets, I would have bought that. But how he managed to turn them on and activate them? was a little bit much. Anyway, again, that's a minor problem, but it's a problem nonetheless, because don't get me wrong, I love the film. I loved the film, but I did still have a couple of issues here and there. Now we see Magneto do what is perhaps one of the biggest things. Evidently, he's perfected his craft, and he lifts up a stadium. And I saw this scene in the trailer, and I thought to myself, that's awesome, <clears throat> that's huge. And he surrounds the White House. Wow. That was... It was horrific. It was a moment where the realism and the idea behind X-Men of a war between humans and different people actually came across again. And how we might not have the upper hand. That was just an absolutely horrific moment to me in the film. And also when they talk about, you know, when they introduce JFK into the film and how he plays into the story, something I found very interesting... And as the scene goes along, you get to see them trying to stop Magneto. And the one moment I loved, the moment that provides the ultimate and perfect redemption for Mystique's character, Mystique, who was good, who was, you know, who was against the idea of mutant and proud in X-Men First Class, but she was a good person. And then she became mutant and proud and in fact kind of went to the negative side of things. How she changes... And how she impersonates Nixon. That was a bit of a surprise moment. And just a beautiful moment at the same time. Absolutely beautiful. And it struck me from a character perspective. And it hit me emotionally almost to see that. <clears throat> because you not... not the, the one side of it is, okay, the president and Trask and everyone's not going to die. The other side of it is Mystique as a character is redeeming herself. And that's what I loved about Days of Future Past. The characters were never, you know, given the backseat. They were always at the forefront. Finally, after that scene, you know, also Magneto has put the Wolverine into the river. Something very important that I have to talk to, talk to you about at the end. 
And finally, you know, you get to see in, in the future that the X-Men are about to be killed. And again, in the nick of time, they get saved. That was fine. The very end of this film, of course, now you get to see the Wolverine back. And you wonder, how did that happen? I thought he drowned and everything. Anyway, you get to see him back with everyone. And when he meets everyone, and when he meets Jean Grey especially, it's a pretty dramatic moment. And I liked how they showed Cyclops. It, it, it wasn't like, oh, there's also Cyclops. It was really well done. And they, they kind of said, oh, something's never changed. And I liked that. I liked the moment where they reintroduce all the old characters. And to see the old actor playing Beast, Kelsey Grammer, if I'm not mistaken, great to see that. But the very ending of the film is something that a lot of people are not reading into. X-Men Days of Future Past to me is a film that does require a bit of a next step in terms of reading into it. Because, excuse me, one thing that I don't think has occurred to a lot of people, but occurred to me. While yes, the continuity errors, blah, 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 fixed, blah, 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 that's not the ending I'm talking about. I'm talking about the very end where Mystique is impersonating Stryker. That, to me, the way it came across to me was interesting because of all the character arcs that were completed in the film, the possible main character, the Wolverine in this case, undone. As an arc, he didn't have a lot to focus on apart from having objectives. But he was not a chess piece in the film, mind you, because his arc is completed through that final shot. You see the despair that he goes through. You see the despair that he's facing in the past and in the future when he sees Stryker and all the flashbacks and the memories. One, now he hasn't killed Jean Grey, sure. But even the pain that he goes through, come to think of it, the fact that Mystique, who has just redeemed herself, is impersonating Stryker. Mystique, who as a character has changed for the better and redeemed herself, who's impersonating Stryker, She's the one who's rescued the Wolverine. A mutant who's also technically a stranger to her. She's rescued him, implying that maybe the Wolverine doesn't undergo any of the adamantium procedures in the future. Maybe none of that happens to him. Think about that. Think about how, in the span of that last shot, and even, of course, when he meets Xavier and when he meets Jean Grey and everyone, but especially that last shot, how all of the Wolverine's problems were solved and how, as a character, through accomplishing this objective, he has not only, you know, saved millions, he saved himself. He changed the course of events for himself unknowingly. Something that I loved, absolutely loved, seeing in the film. X-Men Days of Future Past is a film that... You can check out my review for, you know, my overall perspective of the film. I'm glad I got to delve in to relatively smaller moments. And, of course, the end credit scene. Now, for those of you who don't know, the person that we see is N. Shaban Noor, who is Apocalypse. And Apocalypse is, of course, the villain in X-Men Apocalypse. Undoubtedly, it's going to be the biggest villain and it's going to be the biggest film of course but it's going to be the biggest villain that the x-men are going to face and in fact simon kinberg has said that it's a disaster level event which technically we already got to see with the sentinels but this is just going to be bigger and i like the take of you know building of the pyramids going into that kind of history you know because x-men first class goes into a bit of an alternate history bit so does x-men days of future past but this that the pyramids were built by this mutant, by the world's first and most powerful mutant. And I didn't know anything about Apocalypse until I read up on it. But when I saw that happening, I'm like, that's the world's first mutant. That is the world's first mutant. And they are loving En Shabbat Nur that they are chanting, that I only found out later was Apocalypse. And of course, the Four Horsemen I saw in the background, I had a brief idea of who the Four Horsemen were which was, again, an interesting nod, but I love that in that little moment, you got to see something pretty interesting and something that, while, yes, you're going to have big, massive, spectacular scenes as you did in Days of Future Past in X-Men Apocalypse, I want them to focus on, maybe at least address, the fact that in the past, 
when humans were barely even educated, they worshipped the mutant apocalypse. They worshipped the mutant apocalypse. And now, today, the scene is so different that they almost wanted to destroy the mutants at one point. It's an interesting contrast and something that I hope they really delve in. Uh, sorry, delve into. All right, I have spoken about pretty much scene by scene, X-Men First Class, I, a film that I loved. I've gone over 75 minutes. The previous one was about 39 minutes long. I guess when I have, you know, to talk about spoilers in a particular film, it will go on for a while. I've been talking about X-Men for quite some time now. Thank you so much for watching this. Next week, I'm going to keep bringing this back as I do. I love it, and hopefully I can get back to more videos once again because... As I said, my computer's been having problems. Editing is getting very difficult because my mouse is just going crazy. Nonetheless, I'm so grateful that I got to do this again. And until next time, this is Mr. Film Jack.